Desire is not an insignificant conditioning in us, and it takes many forms. And it's really not the form or even the object that's terribly important or interesting. It's that force, it's that energy, it's that habit pattern of wanting. When we don't see it, when we're caught, when we're identified with that wanting mind, it obscures the natural freedom of mind. It obscures the recognition of the open, empty, selfless nature of awareness. Welcome to the Joseph Goldstein Insight Hour. This podcast is an expression of our shared interest in self-discovery. Join Joseph as he shares his deep knowledge of the path of mindfulness. If you are interested in supporting this podcast, please go to BeHereNowNetwork.com slash Joseph. The nature of the mind is clear, it's lucid, it's unobstructed, it simply knows. That's the nature of consciousness, its function is to know. But somehow we don't recognize this great simplicity, the empty, open, selfless nature of awareness. We so often get distracted and caught up and seduced in a whole variety of ways. We get lost in some deeply habituated patterns of thought and emotion, of desire and aversion, of fear and doubt. And often these patterns are so deeply ingrained, they're so familiar to us. There's so much of who we take ourselves to be that we don't see them clearly, we don't see through them easily. So our practice is to develop a strength of mindfulness, a strength of investigation. So we can begin to see this, these conditioning patterns in the mind that are obscuring the natural innate wakefulness, the natural wisdom. This is not easy to do. And the Buddha talked in one striking image, which most of you are probably familiar with. He said it's more difficult to come to a full and deep and complete understanding of oneself than to overcome single-handedly a thousand enemies a thousand different times. So just imagine yourself. You know, the Buddha was from the warrior caste, so a lot of (laughs) warrior images. Imagine yourself on a battlefield surrounded by a thousand enemies. That's more than the people in this room. (laughs) a thousand and somehow you overcome them and you do that a thousand different times and that's easier than doing what we set about to do here so if you've had some difficulties (laughs) in these days it's not surprising this is a great undertaking a great task but it's possible and the beauty of the teachings is that the Buddha laid out a very systematic, clear methodology for coming to an understanding of our minds. One of the things that so inspires me about the teachings is that they're so uncompromising. Now, when you read the teachings, the Buddha said it just so clearly and so straightforwardly. So I'd like to read one statement, 
one teaching he gave, which outlines what's necessary for coming to that place of freedom, for coming to liberation. And it's striking, and it's startling, and it's challenging. He said that we, that one should make an end to suffering without abandoning the underlying tendencies of desire for pleasant feelings, aversion towards unpleasant ones, and ignorance towards neutral ones. That one should make an end to suffering without abandoning these tendencies. This is impossible. That one should make an end to suffering by abandoning these tendencies of desire for the pleasant, aversion to the unpleasant, confusion about the neutral. This is possible. That's something. I mean, if you've been watching your minds, you know, not only on this retreat, but over all the years of your practice, and seeing the tendency of desire for the pleasant and aversion to the unpleasant, neutral, confusion about the neutral, we really see the task before us if we are really committed to liberation, to awakening. Now, among this teaching group, we have er experts in each of these tendencies. (laughs) There are the experts in desire, the experts in aversion, and the experts in delusion. (laughs) So I'll speak from my own particular area of expertise tonight. (laughs) And that is exploring in some greater detail the tendency of desire. I used to give the whole hindrance talk, you know, with all the five hindrances, but I found I never got past desire. (laughs) So I thought, well, I might as well give a whole talk on it. So how can we understand it? This very, very deep force, deep habit in the mind. And how can we practice being free? Because we need to see it. I mean, this, this, is an essential aspect of what we need to understand, just as the Buddha said. First, to clarify some terminology, because sometimes as words are translated from Pali into English, the translation itself can be the cause of some confusion. And desire is a good example of this, because we use the word desire in English to refer to several different mind states. So it's very helpful to clarify what we mean when we're using this term. One way we use the word desire in English is that motivation of greed, you know, of clinging, of grasping, of craving. Another way we use the word desire is simply the neutral motivation to do something. I have a desire to do, right? So that's the meaning of motivation, and that can either be wholesome or unwholesome, depending what it's associated with. And then there's the desire, we use the word desire to mean the fulfilling just of our basic survival needs, desire for food, desire for water, you know, which does not necessarily involve, involve that greed in the mind or grasping in the mind. Tonight, and in the context the Buddha is talking about abandoning this desire for the pleasant. I'm using this term to refer to that craving in the mind, the grasping in the mind, the clinging in the mind. The word in Pali is tanha, and that's often translated as thirst. You know, it's the thirst for something, the wanting mind. When we don't see this clearly in ourselves, and it's very deeply habituated, when we don't bring some powers of investigation and mindfulness to it, we really are just acting out in our lives this pattern of conditioning, of grasping, of clinging, with all its attendant suffering. 
So tonight I'd like to talk about the three kinds of desire or craving that the Buddha outlined as a way of beginning to deepen our understanding of the forces that are driving us in our lives. The first one is the most obvious and perhaps the one we're most familiar with, and that is the desire for sense pleasures. We like pleasant experience. And we see this at work in our desire for our strongest attachments, you know, attachment to our bodies and the desire or clinging that comes from that or the attachment to other people's bodies and the clinging and attachment to that or maybe to other people, not only their bodies. You know, we see this desire the atta- or attachment in the things that we crave. And there's a wide spectrum in this. It can be obsessive passions which rule our lives. You know, we may either have read of or know of people or perhaps have seen in ourselves at different times when the mind is consumed by some obsessive passion, and that becomes our world. Or it might be a craving, a desire, some level of addiction to something, addictive craving. Could be to food, it could be to sex, it could be to alcohol, it could be to drugs, it could be to work, could be to spy books. <laughs> A little self-confession here. (laughs) But it's just interesting to watch the mind with that kind of addictive quality. It could be in the form of recurrent fantasies that just keep coming back again and again and again, playing themselves out in our minds. Or it could be, and this is kind of on the lightest level, we can observe the desire or craving even in just a momentary passing thought of wanting something. So it goes all the way from consuming passion to various levels of addiction to recurring fantasies to just passing thoughts of the wanting mind. Of course, in our culture, there is a wide scope of activity for desire. You know, it's like we are living in this amazingly privileged, overprivileged, maybe neurotically privileged world, you know, where the level of choice and the level of things and to want is is really overwhelming. We come on retreat, and of course the the field of our desire narrows down a bit. But it's not that desire goes away, as you well know. I don't know that any of you have had this particular experience, but it's one that's not uncommon. You know, in a retreat like this, there are usually a few favored walking spaces. <laughs> you know, and a lot of people want to walk in those spaces. <laughs> if you're one of those people who like to walk in a favored walking space, do you notice how mindfully you get up and leave the hall at the end of a sitting? <laughs> <laughs> Got to get to my space. <laughs> or one thing I've noticed, you know, I can be doing walking meditation when I'm on retreat. And being really slow and precise and mindful and back in the moment. And then the lunch bell rings. And I can be walking just as slowly. Pretending to be just as mindful. (laughs) But inwardly, from paying attention, I can just feel (laughs) that inner push to lunch. Or it might be, this is also not uncommon, um, on retreat, 
uh, where people can spend a lot of time just in recurring sexual fantasies. The hour goes really quickly. <laughs> yeah. And not only does it go quickly, it's pleasant. <laughs> oh, what? It's just, it's just that wanting mind. You know, and you're probably very familiar with the, the phenomenon of the Vipassana romance, you know, where somebody in this room, even though you're not really supposed to be looking at anybody, you know, it catches your eye, catches your imagination. You create this whole fantasy of a romance and then, you know, kind of sneaking glances at that person. There's the desire of wanting diversions. You know, it's just that feeling of one more lifting, moving, placing, I'm going nuts. <laughs> yeah, and so it's just the mind kind of looking for some kind of diversion from being present. How many times a day do you check the bulletin board? <laughs> you know, or read the notices? I, I haven't really checked this one out carefully yet, but at IMS, we have a bulletin board and, you know, and there are a lot of notices that are up there for the whole retreat about, you know, various announcements. It's very often that yogis will just go up to the bulletin board <laughs> and read the same announcement, <laughs> you know, 50 times. It got so bad for me once on one retreat, and my mind was so desperate for a diversion or a distraction, I started reading the ingredients on a detergent box. <laughs> and I just, I'm sitting there, and I'm, I caught myself doing this. <laughs> Desire is not an insignificant conditioning in us, and it takes many forms. And it's really not the form or even the object that's terribly important or interesting. It's that force, it's that energy, it's that habit pattern of wanting. When we don't see it, when we're caught, when we're identified with that wanting mind, it obscures the natural freedom of mind. It obscures the recognition of the open, empty, selfless nature of awareness. We really need to take an interest in seeing how this is working because it's so pervasive and it's so deeply rooted. In one of the Buddha's teachings, he said that anger and aversion is more suffering, but is uprooted more easily. And desire is less suffering, but it's more difficult to uproot because we get seduced by it. We don't really see as clearly the suffering of desire. And so it just kind of spreads out in our lives, in our minds, and we live in that field. In the meditation practice itself, we can watch how desire uh, starts to work. And this is very instructive. If you can begin to see this in your own practice, it will really... Uh, save you a lot of suffering and begin to open the mind into a much freer space. One of the ways, a very common way that desire starts working in our meditation is through the pattern of expectation. Expectation is just the wanting mind. It's wanting something else to be happening. It's a form of desire. One of the things you can notice if you bring attention to that expecting mind, to that wanting mind, that it is a setup for disappointment and discouragement. Expectation is a setup for suffering. But we get so seduced by the allure 
of what we might be expecting, that we're not seeing, we're not really being mindful of the very energy of the expectation and how it's capturing us, how we're in the grip of it. Now, one expression of this expecting mind or wanting mind, which we use as a kind of shorthand, uh, if only, you know, if you, if you have any flavor of if only in your mind, that's a feedback that wanting desire is present. If only this were happening, if only my knee didn't hurt, if only I had better concentration, if only the person next to me wasn't breathing so loudly, if only, and it's endless. So rather than get caught up in the content and either just getting lost in the imagination of what it would be like if only on the one hand or judging it on the other, rather just see it. Oh, that's wanting, that's expectation, that's desire. And in the mindfulness of it, we can disengage, we can become disidentified with it. So expecting, the expecting mind, expectation, that happens a lot in practice. And it causes a lot of agitation, so it's worth paying attention to, you know, and relaxing back behind it. Another pattern of desire or wanting comes in the form of the comparing mind, sort of comparing oneself with others, of competitive sitting, you know, and that really leads to the judging mind. The first year that Sai Dawu Pandita came to America, it was in 1984, and it was this very intense retreat. It was a three-month retreat. He was, in that year, extremely demanding teacher. It was really fierce. Uh, we were seeing him six times a week, and he, the interviews weren't exactly psychologically supportive. <laughs> And I just got into this space, this real kind of competitive space, you know, not overtly, but covertly, you know, with all kinds of judgments about how I was doing and how other people were doing. And it was painful. I mean, it was really painful. And I was driving myself nuts. And then one day it was by the end of three months, it was springtime. And I was walking outside and I saw something which just, the image of it, completely relieved that kind of comparing mind. And it was just a very simple image, which you're all, I'm sure, very familiar with. But it was spring in Massachusetts, and the tulips were just beginning to come up. I was doing some walking meditation outside, and I observed, and it's, you know, very simply, that some of the tulips were up, and the flowers had opened, you know, in full bloom. And the other the tulips had come up, but they hadn't quite opened. And some were just coming out of the ground. And I saw the tulips in all of these stages. And it was just like this completely natural reminder that everything unfolds in its own time. It's like the tulip that had already bloomed was not a better tulip <laughs> then the tulip that was just coming up, you know, everything happens according to their appropriate conditions. And if we just create the conditions, everything will happen in its own time, just as it's supposed to. And it, I mean, it's so simple, you know, and that lesson is all around us. But it was a tremendous help for me in my practice. I really just relaxed. You know, I just, just sit and walk and sit and walk and let the Dharma unfold. Let it happen in its own time, in its own way. So I would urge you to really be watchful for that kind of self-judging or comparing mind of wanting something, you know, and, and to have the ease of settling back in your practice. So 
So there's the desire that comes in the form of expectation. There's the desire that comes in the form of comparing. There's the desire in our practice that comes in the form of wanting to hold on to some pleasant experience we're having or to get a pleasant experience we've had to get it back again. This also is just the cause of so much frustration for us. Uh, One story which perhaps some of you know. Years ago when I was practicing in India, I had been there for some years and after having gotten over the initial you know, real difficulties. I was at a stage in my practice where everything was going so smoothly. You know, my mind was concentrated. The awareness was sharp. My whole body had opened. And it just, it's like I was sitting with this body of light. Every time I sat down, it was just light. I thought, this is great. You know, this is what I've come for. And then after, and it lasted quite a while, I mean, this was like a couple of months like this. And then I had to come back to America uh, for some time and do some work, make some more money to go back to India. I went back to India and sat down and couldn't wait to get back to my body of light. Well, it had become a body of twisted steel. (laughs) That's what it felt like. You know, it's... it's, ah, ah. And I was struggling in my practice and trying to work my awareness through my body and open it up and get the light back. And I spent two years in that struggle. I mean, two years of holding that image in my mind of what it was like and wanting to get it back and struggling to get it back. It took that long. I mean, this is really a slow learner. <laughs> To realize it's not about getting anything back. It's simply about opening to whatever is present. Holding on to a past experience and trying to get it back is like dragging a corpse around. That experience is dead. It's gone. It's finished. And we're in whatever process we're in. And when finally, you know, I got it and As I say, it was a really slow, painful process. I just relaxed into the body of steel. You know, okay, and so that was it. And in that openness, then the energy started to move again and it really felt like I was back on the Dharma path. So it was a very important lesson. You know, that it's not about having a particular experience, holding to a particular experience, getting any particular experience back again. And I share this story with you so that you don't spend two years in that mistake. It's all about opening to what's arising in the moment without grasping, without aversion. The freedom of mind is always possible in the moment. It's not about the experience. It's about how we're relating to it. Not only does do unnoticed desires hinder our clear seeing, it hinders the development of concentration, it hinders our recognition of the innate open wakefulness of the mind when we're caught up in the wanting and desire. Even more ironically, it does not fulfill its promise of happiness. And the reason we get caught up in these desires is because the desire is holding out to us this promise of this will make you happy. But if we're paying attention to our experience and to our lives, we see that, yes, they do give some kind of temporary pleasure, but they are not the cause of some ultimate happiness or ultimate peace. Because if they were, you wouldn't be here. I mean, why would you come and do this? You know, if the cappuccino really did make you completely happy. (laughs) 
we go after these objects of desire because of the pleasant feeling we get with them. And they are pleasant. They are pleasant feelings. But the problem is, as we all know, the pleasant feelings don't last. So we have it. And we have the pleasant feeling, and then it's gone, and then we need another, and that's gone, and then we need another and another, and so we're just on this treadmill, continually seeking another hit of pleasant experience, thinking it will make us happy, having it disappear, needing more. And so we lead a life of continually being ultimately unfulfilled, not at peace. It's like trying to quench our thirst by drinking salt water. You know, we think it's going to quench our thirst because it's water, but of course the salt just makes us thirstier. This force of desire, of wanting, is so deep in us. This is not a trivial conditioning. This is the force that is driving samsara. The Buddha talked of how ignorance and craving together, and the craving coming out of ignorance, that is at the root of what's driving this whole huge cycle of birth and death and rebirth. So it's a powerful, powerful conditioning. And in one way, that's what makes it so interesting to observe. It's not a trivial matter. It's really about the very nature of our existence, the nature of life and death. Now, we all know that the experience of pleasant feelings is not really going to bring us a lasting peace because we've all had an endless number of these pleasant feelings. My first teacher, Anagarika Munindraje, he used to say, where is the end of seeing? Where is the end of hearing? Where is the end of tasting? Where is the end of touching sensations in the body? This doesn't mean that we should never enjoy ourselves. That's, that's not the implication of this or that we should not enjoy the different pleasant experiences as they come, because they do. And most of us are quite blessed in that we enjoy a lot of pleasant experience in our lives. It's just that we need to wake up and be very conscious of the fact that all of these pleasant experiences are indeed transitory. They're not lasting. And to take a look in our lives to see how much of our time and energy is devoted to the pursuit of these pleasant feelings, these pleasant experiences. How much of our energy do we want to invest in this endless pursuit? So it's not a question of pushing away or avoiding, but where are we putting our energy? What are we devoting our lives to? to something that will actually bring us a sense of peace or to things that just keep us on the treadmill of wanting more. Dharma practice opens us to the possibility of much greater kinds of happiness. The Buddha talked of seven kinds of happiness. He has lists for everything. So there are seven kinds of happiness And the happiness of the sense pleasures are just the first one or two. It's like there are levels of happiness which go way beyond the happiness of sense pleasure. So it's not really that we're abandoning the source of happiness in our lives. We're we're seeing through different kinds of addiction that prevent us from experiencing greater happiness. Okay, so this is the desire for ple- sense, pleasant sense experience. It's the first kind of craving. That's just the first. <laughs> the second kind of craving. And this is deeper and more subtle 
You know, it's not as obvious. And that is the desire or craving we have for existence. Craving for existence. It's the basic urge or desire to be. Now we can talk about this in several ways. In the Buddhist cosmology, you know, with all the different planes of existence, the lower realms and the higher realms, this craving for existence is often refers to craving for existence in the higher realms, existence in the deva realms. You know, and the Buddha described these heavenly realms in quite a bit of detail. And they're wonderful. You know, there are these realms where there are just beings of light, you know, luminous bodies, and supposedly you're born there spontaneously. It's not like through... Uh, you know, given birth through a womb, this, you just appear spontaneously. It's said you, you appear, you're just about 16 or 17 years old, you know, in the height of one's youth, ready to enjoy oneself. <laughs> and there's heavenly music and the description of the heavenly pleasure groves, and there are even heavenly meditation halls for those who can tear themselves away uh, from, from the other pleasures. And there, you know, even though we read these in the text, and my teacher, Munindra, and when I first went to India, he loved giving these long descriptions of these heaven worlds. And I love listening to them. <laughs> you know, it's just, it sounds so, because especially in that context, <laughs> heaven looked pretty good. <laughs> And one time, you know, our teacher Deepama, this wonderful woman, powerful, powerful woman in yogi, she had all, in addition to being, you know, at high stages of enlightenment, had all kinds of powers of mind. And there's actually a book coming out of her life, just of her personal story and her suffering and also her attainments. And it talks a lot about the incredible, unbelievable things she could do. But one time she was visiting us in, uh, in Barry in the fall. You know, New England in the fall is really beautiful. And the, there's a pond right near IMS and there's just, you know, forest around the pond. So all the leaves, you know, these brilliant colors and reflecting in the pond. And it's, it's really a beautiful sight, you know, for this, for this plain. So we were walking there with Deepama and I turned to her and I said, is this as nice as the Deva worlds? You know, thinking that she would, be forced to agree it was. <laughs> and she just looked at me and said, nah. <laughs> and as Munindraji would often say after, after his long raps, you know, about these, knowing that Westerners really are quite generally quite skeptical about all this, uh, he said, you don't have to believe this. I mean, none of this is really necessary for enlightenment or awakening. It's true, but you don't have to believe it. <laughs> so often this craving for existence is talked about within this Buddhist cosmology about that kind of craving, you know, craving for more pleasurable existence. But of course, the Deva worlds themselves are still on this wheel of life and death. You know, and so they may, people, beings, they may live a very long time, but they're still subject to the same law of change that we are. It's not enlightenment. It's not freedom. For us, on this plane, there's a more immediate meaning to this craving for existence, which plays itself out in our meditation practice. And so I find that even though that kind of, you know, kind of, can delight the mind just with those images. It's really looking at the craving for existence as it's playing itself out within us now that is very instructive and can be very freeing in your meditation. And that is the desire or craving to the unfolding process itself. And it's that experience of sitting you know, and especially at a certain point when the meditation is going more smoothly, 
you know, and for those of you who are more experienced may have had this experience, uh, you know, it's really just rolling along, you know, and you're not kind of having to make such an effort to be mindful and present. But that tendency of the mind of leaning into the process, we're with this breath in order to feel the next breath, or we're, we're with the sensation in order to see how it unfolds. And so it's always that leaning forward into it in anticipation. That's a kind of craving for existence. We're not simply back in the moment, free of attachment, free of clinging, Do you follow what I mean? We're engaged, we're pulled in to the very process of change that we're observing. So this is very subtle, but very important, because as long as we're pulled into it, we're still caught in what the Buddha called the process of becoming. We're not at rest. The mind is not free. So be watchful of the mind leaning into, anticipating, being with this in order to get to the next moment. Is, see it even in the walking meditation, you know, lifting in order to move forward instead of being totally back and open just in the experience of lifting. Just this, just this, just this. At one point uh, when I was practicing in Burma, again, I'd been there for some months, my my mind had gotten really very still, very concentrated, and I was just completely fascinated by the process that was going on. It was so, my attention was so microscopic. You know, it's just the subtlest kind of uh, aspects of the flowing energy field. And I would be going in and reporting this to Upandita. Uh, you know, and day after day it was going on like this. And in one interview... I went in, and all he said to me was, you're too attached to subtlety. (laughs) And it was a great, it was really a helpful interview because I didn't even know. You know, for me, I thought I was, my practice was going great. You know, and I was just seeing more and more detail and getting closer and closer and closer. But he was pointing out that even that can become an attachment. You know, that I was leaning into it too much. The practice is not about getting anything. It's about letting go. So this is the craving for existence, the craving for becoming. Again, some words from the Buddha, which if you could really first remember them and then apply them. It's really the whole of the practice which is contained in these few words. Not reviving the past, not hoping to be in the future. Instead, with insight, see each arising state. Not craving after past experience, not setting one's heart on future ones, not bound up with desire and craving. I mean, just think of how much of our lives is spent looking back to past experience, hoping for some future experience. That's probably 90% of our lives. And the Buddha is saying just, Find that empty middle where we're not looking back, we're not reviving the past, we're not hoping for the future. Just in those, just in those couple of phrases, you can get the sense of a possibility. Not reviving the past, not hoping for the future. It's all right here, and it's always right here. But we have to see those patterns of the mind because they're so deeply habituated. So there's the craving for sense pleasure. That's one kind of craving that obscures this openness of mind. 
There's the craving for existence, that leaning into the becoming, which obscures the openness of mind. The third kind of desire the Buddha mentioned is craving for non-existence. And in the Buddhist philosophy, this is called the annihilationist view. You know, and it has many different aspects. One aspect is the belief that at death, that's the end of things, that there's no continuity of consciousness, so that's one meaning of it. But this desire for non-existence also in its more kind of mundane application in our lives really has to do with wanting experience to go away. In dramatic terms, life is so bad, if only I could not be. And we have this in various ways. It's at that 84 retreat, which was so intense and, you know, it was so difficult in so many ways. I was sitting in this, I had a basement room at IMS and I was sitting there and it was really, it was really hard. You know, at one point, Sidow's instructions to me was, uh, just sit until the pain comes and then sit through it. <laughs> well, that wasn't too easy. So at one point when I was going through kind of real struggles, I would hear these planes flying over. And in my mind, this was in 84. I remember wishing, I hope they're the Russians and they're dropping bombs. (laughs) (laughs) Anything to get out of here. (laughs) It wasn't the most compassionate thought for my fellow yogis, but (laughs) I really didn't care. (laughs) Well, that's the craving for (laughs) non-existence. Let me out of here. Because this desire, as well as the desire for existence, is all fueled by the notion of self, of I, the belief that there's someone there to either be or to not be. But this is a whole other Dharma talk for another time. (laughs) I see my colleagues getting nervous. <laughs> okay, so how can we use this time of retreat and our practice to really look at and understand deeply this powerful conditioning of desire in all its forms? Desire for pleasant experience, desire for existence, desire for non-existence. Obviously, the first thing we need to do, and it's a practice because it's not easy to do, is to recognize it when it arises. You know, it's become so invisible. It's become so much a part of us, of who we are, that we really have to pay attention to all the forms of the wanting mind, whether it's for for pleasant experience or expectation or comparing, whatever form it's taken, the if only And the key is to take interest in it rather than judging it or judging oneself. When I see desire arise in my mind, and often often it's easiest with something that's very small. It's just fascinating to me to... It's almost like tracing back the root, not... not, uh, the story or the content, but energetically. Well, just, just as a simple example, um, one time I was on retreat and I was just walking, I was sitting upstairs in my house, walking down the stairs to the bottom floor and I was going to go outside and do some walking meditation. And halfway down the stairs, just the quick thought comes, oh, a cup of tea would be nice. That's all. It was just that. I got to the bottom of the stairs, turned left into the kitchen. <laughs> And it was just amazing to me. What was that about? You know, what was the power behind that momentary thought? And I was astounded just to see how it's like a very tiny thought, but with this hugely deep root. 
you know, which is that force, that habit of wanting. So it's just interesting. And if we take interest in it, we can begin to unpack and at different times make some wise choices. We can also, and this I found very helpful, not only in meditation practice, but in my life of relationship with other people, of to look at desire at which lies at the root of many kinds of suffering. As an example, now there are many feelings we have, painful feelings of jealousy, of envy, of discouragement, of a long list. And very often I find that when I'm suffering, and there's some strong emotional suffering going on, when I trace it back, very often I find that it comes back to some kind of wanting. It's wanting something. It's wanting something from a person. It's wanting some object. It's wanting something to be different. But again, not not stopping in the storyline along the way, but coming right back energetically to the wanting that's at the root of the suffering. And I feel it, and I invite you just to look and see for yourself, that I can feel it often as this contraction. It's an energetic contraction. You know, right in the heart. It's that the contraction of wanting. And if we can trace it back to that place, we can learn some very interesting things about it. And this is really getting right to the root of much of the suffering in our lives. We can begin to see that the wanting itself is selfless. The wanting itself is arising out of conditions. And that, and this is, this is the liberating point. So (laughs) pay attention. That our identification with that wanting is a choice. And I have seen this often enough to know the truth of it. The wanting is going to be there out of a condition. How we can't often control whether the wanting is going to arise or not. But if we're mindful enough, aware enough to not get seduced by what it is we want, but to come back to the feeling of wanting, that energetic contraction of wanting, and we're aware of that, right in that space, we see that we can either identify with that and suffer, or not identify with that wanting and let go of suffering. That identification with wanting is a choice, but it's a very subtle place. I say all this, again, not as things you should necessarily believe, but just things that I've kind of explored in my own practice that have been really helpful in this arena of desire and craving and wanting. And so it's really an invitation for you to bring that level of investigation and interest to your own experience. The beauty and the power of a retreat is that we actually have the time, you know, to develop the stillness, develop the concentration, heighten our awareness so we can explore, so we can look, so we can investigate this deeply, deeply conditioned uh, habit of wanting, of craving. And again, this is at the very core. The Buddha, the Buddha highlighted this. This is the driving energy of our lives of samsara. 
this wheel of life and death. So it's not insignificant. And in this exploration, through a sustained power of awareness, we really begin to taste for ourselves the possibility of freedom. We see that possibility. We experience even for short moments. But it really reveals something to us, which is then tremendously inspiring. We see what's possible. Let's sit for a couple of minutes. As you sit with each breath, each half breath, see if you can settle back into the awareness of just that half breath without the leaning forward, leaning into, without the anticipating, without looking back. The whole practice is this half breath. 